sight, for you are the source of our strength, and you are the rock of our redemption. Amen. I am preaching another preacher's sermon this morning. I want to just say that right out front, like the good student that I am, footnoting the whole thing properly. It's not because I didn't have the time or the inspiration or the inclination to preach on this text and to share with you my thoughts. This text from the book of Exodus that begins our journey through the life of Moses, a life which with, with, with whom we will be engaged for a number of weeks now. Moses is perhaps the most important figure in the entire Hebrew Bible. It bears uh, our attention. But because in my research, I came across this particular sermon, first in written form and then on a video on YouTube, and was so moved by it that I realized I wanted you to hear it as well, not unfortunately from the lips of the original preacher, but rather from me. The preacher is Florence Carter, uh, uh, Anna Carter Florence, Anna Carter Florence, who is the professor of preaching at the Columbia Theological School in Decatur, Georgia, a Presbyterian school of renown. After reading the account from Exodus, which another woman read before you this morning, an account about how after the new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph or his saga, or who chose not to know the saga and story of Joseph and his family, how in response to that situation, God selected several women through whom God would work to carry out God's purpose and plan. After reading this account out loud before a gathered congregation, Dr. Florence begins to speak. What a perfect story. Pharaoh makes chaos. Mother makes ark. Princess finds baby. Sister brokers deal. Baby saved. Pharaoh foiled. A perfect story and great roles for girls, I might add. Not quite the Bible meets Frozen, but almost. So before we get into it, I want you to notice two things. The first thing is that the main characters are young people and their parents aren't around. That's important because this is a story about what happens when young people are in charge. The second is that without this story, without these two girls in the reeds by the Nile, there is no Moses, there is no Exodus, there is no liberation for the people of God, and there won't be until the parents get off the stage and the young people set things in motion. So you've got two stock roles for girls here. Beautiful princess, responsible big sister. You pick either one, they're both good parts, even for you guys listening out there, just use your imagination. You can be Pharaoh's daughter, clad in silks, dipping your lovely toes in the cool green water, or you can be Moses' sister, alone in the reeds, keeping watch over the basket by day and by night. You can be the powerful princess or the smart and resourceful sister. Like I said, you can't lose. They're both strong characters. And while the text doesn't tell us exactly how old they were, whether they were 20-somethings or teenagers or perhaps even younger, what it does tell us is that each of them had an inner radical just waiting to be unleashed. Each of them was ready to set aside what she should do and to work together on what they might do, which is what happens when you're down in the reeds. I want to walk through you through some of the story. Again, it's familiar, but you know how Scripture is. You hear it differently every time. So let's read it today the way the girls in the story lived it, as if their parents weren't around, which is an interesting interpretive lens, come to think about it, reading Scripture as if your parents aren't watching. A lot of people my age could stand to do that. So you know the context. We're in Egypt, which was a world superpower in those days. And the Hebrews are the Egyptian slaves. But the Hebrew population is growing. It's big enough to make Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, feel threatened and worried that soon these people will be almost as numerous as, as his own. You know how it is. You go downtown and you hear Hebrew spoken rather than Egyptian or Spanish rather than English. So Pharaoh comes up with a highly effective and unspeakably evil plan to control them. He targets the boys 
Every Hebrew boy, baby that is born, Pharaoh orders his Egyptian citizens, is to be exterminated on sight. Pitch him in the Nile. Pharaoh knows. Target the boys of the people you want to dominate, and eventually you'll destroy them. Moses, of course, was a boy, and so his mother did what she could. She hid him for a while, but babies grow. And when she couldn't hide him anymore, we read in verse 3 that Moses' mother, the daughter of Levi, does a priestly act. She takes a bunch of papyrus, loams it with the ancient equivalent of Kevlar, and makes a smug little ark for her son. It's a brilliant act, a symbolic act, designed to save life as well as to make witness, and it is heartbreakingly limited. A Kevlar Ark can't save a child for long. He has one day, maybe two, before he will die of exposure. One day, maybe two days to live. And anyone who finds him will get the mother's message loud and clear. This is what we've come to in Egypt. Take a look. Kevlar cradles. It's all I could do for my child. All I could give him was two more days. With that, the mother leaves the scene. Maybe she was like Hagar, who couldn't bear to watch baby Ishmael die in the desert. We don't know, but what we do know is that it's the sister who takes over from here. That's what big sisters or big brothers do. They watch when the parents leave. They report back. It may not be what they choose to do, but it's their job as part of the family. It was this sister's job. Stand at a distance and see what happens to your brother. Be the girl in the reeds and then come home. Verse 5, enter Pharaoh's daughter. She has a different agenda. She came down to the river to take a bath. She came down to get away from it all, the court, the publicity, the pressure, the pedestal, being beautiful is a tough job. But that's what princesses are. Everything we dream we could be. It's their job as part of the family. It was this princess's job. Take your maids, go to the river, and anoint that lovely skin because we need you to look good this afternoon. Be the girl in the reeds and then come home. So here they are, two girls in the reeds. Two girls who know what they are supposed to do. Hide and watch bathe and dress. Do as you're told and then come home. And they might have done it and never met one another, but you know the reeds are a watery, slippery, in-between sort of place. It's muddy and murky and hard to find your footing, and who knows where the deep water starts. Anything can happen down in the reeds to upset your balance. And on this day, something did. You know what it was. The princess found a baby. The Egyptian princess found a Hebrew baby. You know what she was supposed to do with it. So did she. So did the sister. And now what? What do you do with a baby in a basket when you're down in the reeds at the river's edge and the parents, your parents, are nowhere to be found? The princess knew what her father would have done, or at least what his law decreed. If it was a Hebrew child and it was, she was supposed to tip over the basket and let the baby tumble into the river. At the very least, she was supposed to close the lid, give the ark a little push, and send it down the river for someone else to deal with. That's what the law required, like it or not, and she was supposed to uphold it. The sister knew what her mother wanted. If someone found the baby, even if that someone was an Egyptian, the sister was supposed to keep watching, as awful as things might get. She was supposed to stay in her hiding place so she wasn't seen and she wasn't caught, and then she was to report to her mother all that had happened. That's what times like these required, like it or not, and she was supposed to just try and survive. Two girls in the reeds with a little body in between them. They knew what their parents would have wanted. And you know what? They didn't do it. They couldn't do it. Things look different when you're down in the reeds. You have to think for yourself, look for yourself, tell it like you see it, which is what the princess did. This, she said, must be one of the Hebrew children. 
Sometimes the truth is the most radical thing you can say. Just to name it, what you see right in front of you. A body left for hours in the street, a baby left to die in a basket, a Syrian child lying bloated and broken on a beach. Just telling the truth about it is huge. Saying it out loud, letting it reverberate in the air. This must be one of the Hebrew children because no other mothers are reduced to this, making little arcs to float on the Nile, trying to save their babies from a flood of hate. Well, one truth calls forth another, especially when you're down in the reeds. One girl, stammering out the truth about what she sees, invites the other girl to speak up too. One girl, pausing over unspeakable evil, encourages another to stand with her. This must be one of the Hebrew children, said the princess, and then the sister got an idea. Do you want for me to find a nurse from among the Hebrew women, she asked, stepping out of her hiding place. Do you want me to find someone to nurse that child for you? And just like that, they had a plan. A plan to save one life, no matter what their parents thought. And it was just about the craziest plan you could think of. To take baby Moses back to his Hebrew mother for a few years and tell everyone it was just fine because it was on Pharaoh's daughter's orders. Really. But they did it. And they got away with it. And when Moses was three years old, the princess actually adopted him. She took him into the palace, and she raised him as her own, with her father down the hall. And Lord knows what he thought about the whole arrangement. Little Moses sitting in his booster seat at the royal table, riding his Toys R Us chariot around the throne room. Scripture never tells us anything about that. But, as we said, this isn't a story about the parents and doing what they told you, even if your dad is the Pharaoh. This is a story about young people doing whatever crazy thing they can dream up together to get bodies out of reeds. So now I'm wondering about you. I'm wondering about us. I'm wondering what's going on where we live, in our city in our neighborhoods, in our country during one of the most surreal periods of time I can remember. I don't think it's overstating it to say that we're in the reeds, y'all. A wall being proposed to keep people out. A travel ban to prevent certain folks from certain places from coming in. Demonstrations by white supremacists and Nazis on one hand and pastors and people on the other and a president unable to tell the moral difference apparently. And an uprising of the Ku Klux Klan right here in River City in Worcester in Wayne County. They've brought up these things all these years. Like, why does racism still have a grip on us? What are we going to do about diversity and difference? How on earth are we going to have conversations without shutting or shouting each other down? What do you do when you're out there in that muddy, slippery, in-between place down in the reeds? How do you keep listening and talking and praying? I think this story has some things to say to us. So what happens if we bring these two girls to the streets of Worcester where you and I live and ask them to show us some new ways to be? Maybe one of the first things they'd say is what we've been picking up throughout this text. We don't have to read the world the way our parents read it. There will come a day when we're down in the reeds and our parents aren't there and we have to decide for ourselves about what we're going to do about this situation, this interruption, this baby in a basket, this child on a beach, this flyer in our parks or in our mailboxes. And if the way we've been taught to read the world tells us that it doesn't matter, that we can just turn around and walk away, then something has to change and it's up to us to change it. 
And then maybe the second thing they'd say, these two girls, is if you're down in the reeds and you don't know what to do, start by telling the truth about what you see. Sometimes that's the most radical thing we can do, just to tell the truth about the body in front of us, about a person struggling to be free. This is one of the Hebrew children. Say it out loud, because one truth calls forth another, and you never know who might be listening. You never know who might be waiting for a reason to come out from their hiding place to stand beside you and make a plan to save one life. And maybe the third thing they'd say, these two girls, is that this is how liberation starts. God's liberating work starts down in the reeds with an interruption we didn't expect, with a body we have to acknowledge. God's liberation of a people can start with two girls and one really crazy idea. That's it. That's all you need. Because whenever the children of God claim the freedom to reimagine and remix the world, well then... Moses can grow up. The exodus out of slavery can begin. And I tell you what, we all need to get out of Egypt. And that's the next chapter in this perfect story. Maybe we'll write it. Offered up to you this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.